Welcome, everybody, uh, uh, joining us now uh, on uh, this uh, sixth lecture of our 10 lecture series on uh, Rojava, uh, Resistance, Resilience, and Renewal, uh, Democratic Confederalism, and the Changing Face of Revolution. Uh, this series is being co-sponsored by the Global University for Sustainability, uh, by the Civil Diplomacy Center uh, in North and East Syria, and by uh, Synergia Cooperative Institute, of uh, which I am a member and co-founder. Uh, the, um, the subject for today's lecture is a political and ethical society and uh, the social justice system. Uh, we are happy to welcome uh, two uh, wonderful uh, participants. Our guest is Ainur Church and Protection of Women's Rights uh, in Northeast Syria, and uh, Father Edwin John, uh, who is a founder and member of the Neighborhood Councils uh, in India. Uh, Ainur will speak uh, on uh, her subject for about uh, an hour, uh, at which time uh, we will then take a response from Father Edwin John, who will speak uh, for about 20 minutes. And then we leave the uh, dialogue session open uh, for comments and questions from uh, other panelists and participants. Please make sure that you're muting uh, your microphone when you're not speaking and uh, do select uh, the language you wish to hear from the, uh, the button at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen uh, that has a little uh, globe on it and you can select from English or Kurdish uh, on, the, uh, on the languages you prefer. So uh, without any uh, further delay, uh, I'm very happy and very privileged uh, to welcome our uh, guest speaker, uh, Ainur um, uh, Pasha. Uh, please uh, begin when you're ready and uh, uh, we are anticipating your, your comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to you too. I am a lawyer, Ainur Pasha, and I'm also focusing on the uh, women rights in entire region in northern eastern Syria. Today is the 3rd of uh, July. It is the anniversary of uh, the 3rd of August. It is the anniversary of the atrocities of uh, ISIS on the women in Shingal region. And we also would like to commemorate this day and once again denounce these atrocities and inhumane treatment of women by the ISIS. It was a feminicide carried out in Shingal. It was a genocide against the people in Shingal that took place in our uh, 21st century. We saw that how brutal ISIS captured and enslaved women and they turned them into sex slaves. So it's an important day and it's, today is the anniversary, so we would like to remember that. In our system of autonomous administration in Northern and Eastern Syria, we have the social justice system. It is, I would like to describe this system at the beginning of my speech it's based on moral values so moral moral actually it's a word which has the original meaning of creation you create your own standards your own uh, rules It started from the days of the people used stones and turned them into tools. That's how they started creating and deciding and determining uh, their lives. And 
the, the way that you create, the way that you, you live and you decide how you are going to do it, it brings your moral values. These moral values, when they become tradition, and through the side, it also will be widespread. And then there are people following these kind of values, then it becomes moral. It is the ethics, the moral that we talk about today. This is a quote which is not written, but but it's more meaningful than the written law or piece of legislation. The the nature moral it becomes as a result of this natural way of life and deciding how to live uh, on what basis according to which rules that's how you decide your moral values it it also creates this understanding of the good for the entire society And also, moral also plays a very significant role in the freedom of the of the society. And moral morality it also defines a political uh, memory of the society because it changes or it's based on these experiences, political experience of the societies that they go through and in the in the basis of in our system it's an ecological system based also on the freedom of free freedom of women which was developed by mr Öcalan. the societies that are organized around uh, moralities are the societies where you can see a very strong feeling of of justice and on the other hand if the societies get distant from the moral values uh, uh, in the same way they will lose their understanding and the values like democracy rights and respect to each other And it will also bring the repression on the society by the hands of the rulers. And social justice is the essence of the of the democratic of the democratic confederalism. And the na democratic nation also accepts this value, and it also put, puts in the core of it the way the way of, of, of organization. And from the beginning of the crisis in, uh, in Syria, people started organizing themselves and the first in Jazeera region and Kobani region, they organized themselves on the, on the essence, on the principle of the, of the uh, democratic autonomy. In, within this structure, we have an, a council for legislative legislative council, and there is another council for uh, can be the executive power. And the third uh, pillar is the justice system, which is also based on the social justice. The council of civil uh, social justice they they start establishing their institutions where they can function within their uh, capacities so the first question was of course what is a so what is the social justice how we can realize social justice it is the understanding of justice It's, it was based on the 
the understanding and the mindset of society and historical and political background that influenced them and the injustice uh, injustices should be removed in order to realize a social um, common understanding of justice and it is also based on the so uh, moral values of the society that's how it was defined at the beginning and accordingly according to this definition there are some features of social justice one of them is is that it's a historical basis because when we look at the it's the justice is not something that recently appeared it is a discussion coming through the history and it also uh, rela closely related to the history of the society And and another one is the is the mindset, the mentality of the uh, the mentality. Because when you look at all the problems and the justice or all the contradictions that you can see in the society, they also have a relationship, a direct link to the mentality about the equality between genders or. Or, uh, or just liberating yourself from the uh, other influences. And another feature is the democracy for the, for the justice, because in order to realize the justice, you need democracy where the people can rule or govern themselves and have a say uh, have a say in the in the in the in the governance it also brings the cooperation and mutual respect which will reduce the problems that might occur within this society but here morality plays a significant role to bring this the social justice and social peace Another feature that we can underline for the social justice is are the uh, democratic laws, the, the laws that which are approved by the local councils, which respect or which also represent the will of the people living in that region. Another feature of it is of social justice in northern and eastern Syria is, is, is the peace. Peace it's, it's providing, continuing the uh, social peace. And in order to have a peace in the society, you need uh, basic rules and respect to these rules as we know at most those who suffered because of the injustice in the society are the women it's because of the this patriarchal mentality of men always made women suffer and they were always being undermined by the men therefore and affirmative actions are also considered for the woman to uh, to to fight against injustice so they get this positive discrimination in our justice system until these uh, deep rooted problems are solved another topic is that every We don't consider the human beings are uh, as 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 criminals or guilty. We believe that people becomes criminals or guilty 
according to the according to the circumstances that surrounds them. So we believe that in essence, human beings are peaceful and and not uh, necessarily uh, have a tendency uh, has a tendency to to commit a crime. It's mostly about the the circumstances and also how they are in uh, how they are alienated from the society so but we believe that this, the the individuals uh, the more the closer they are to the society less likely that they will commit a crime social justice in our And our justice system is based on two, uh, two main pillars. One of them is the Council of Reconciliation, and another one is the women's houses. It's not directly starting with the courts, but before the court, it's about the reconciliation. You can see... Our reconciliation councils are also social councils so which that they are elected the members are elected on the local basis and the members are the prominent people which are respected within the society or they they are considered as like the wise people or they are known as persons with morals and ethics and fair and these people and they're also the members of the council of reconciliations are all volunteers they are not paid and they are also persons with experience in terms of reconciliation bringing peace and finding solutions for the problems within the society these reconciliation councils or committees can also share the burden of the of the of the courts and and the members of these reconciliation committees these persons It is. It's not a. It's not a court making decisions on behalf of the involved parties or the sides. But their their way of functioning is actually convincing each other, and in and they act always within the principles of the democratic nation. And no decision or no reconciliation can be. Uh, against against any woman or it always has to be in favor of women in these matters which are related to the woman directly this role is assumed by the woman houses because the woman houses they also act as the reconciliation councils related to the woman issues and it's also considered to be a part of the justice system and when we talk about peace, peace has to be based on justice and fairness. And in order to have a peace, you have to convince both parties uh, involved in a dispute, for example. And also these reconciliation committees, have they have to be impartial. They cannot favor any parties involved in a dispute. And as we said, all the decisions made are based on the moral values which will be acceptable for the parties. When two, when two parties involved in a dispute, and if one of them belongs to a different uh, ethnicity, religion, or a different circuit of the society, in that case, this council always need to uh, consider the brotherhood and sisterhood of the people living together. It has to be, 
it has to be taken into consideration and any decisions that made should serve to, to this uh, coexistence of different ethnic and religious groups. And these groups, these committees, also about the uh, customs of the society, the traditions, the customs which cause uh, disputes and conflict, they should be removed. They don't take into consideration and always the, the tradition should favor the, the, the tradition should be take, uh, being favored that bringing serving peace rather than inciting hating among people. And this system is also based on the uh, other criminology uh, principles like the uh, witnesses and also evidence and presumption of innocence whatsoever. In the hearings, The defendants, they, they, they also have enough, uh, they are listened, they are asked questions, and they can also defend themselves if it is uh, and with the presence of the older parties. They are like public hearings, and, and as you know, in this system of democratic confederalism, the communes are the most important uh, piece of this system and the and the, the communes when uh, within there are discussions within the communes and if they cannot reach a solution they can also take it a, a certain matter to do council or committee of reconciliation to find uh, a solution it's about the commune members and the the members of these reconciliation committees are also not alienated. They are also from the same region. They know each other. They know the families. They know uh, they know the people who are involved. So this reconciliation council uh, as uses it as an advantage of being local, so that they can find a, a solution which will be acceptable for every everyone. And if the P, if the committee of reconciliation solves the problem and the involved parties are, uh, they they agree on it, they then the matter is closed. But if the dispute continues and the parties involved are not convinced, they write a report about the matter and and it can be transferred to the uh, to the reconciliation committee of the region or on the on the on the province in a different level so according to the administrative system it can be district it can be the city or it can be the province and this is the second east instance in the districts or the of the province They also try to find a solution for the for the dispute, and if it remains, if it goes on, they also get an opinion of the uh, this this another instance of the reconciliation council, and they try to find a solution and bring the solution for the different parties. And, but in the province level, it is the third is instance, it's the last one, and it that the dispute has to be solved at the at this last instance and convince the parties involved. Of course, it's it doesn't involve any any threats or any pressure. It's the same principle applies there too. It has to be on voluntary 
uh, acceptance and the parties should be convinced. And as, as a result, if the dispute is solved, then there is, there is also a, it, there is a decision. It's like a contract uh, by the, with the participation of the uh, parties involved in dispute. It becomes like a reconciliation contract between them. And eventually, if it, the, as we said, the, parties involved, they have to agree on it because we think that even if a court decides on a matter and if the parties are not convinced, it doesn't mean that the, the dispute is over. No, it will continue. It will remain uh, causing problems. So we prefer uh, a decision made by a court rather than a decision made by a court, then um, we prefer a solution with the participation of the parties and uh, with their own voluntary uh, acceptance. Of course, as we said, the members of these councils are influential personalities from the region, which are known for being fair, justice, and having moral values. And eventually, if the, everything is solved, then there is a report written about the dispute. All the all the problems that might occur within the society can go to the co uh, the committees of reconciliation and they use all their uh, capabilities to solve uh, the dispute. But if it is a matter which requires an ex expert or expert opinion, then they can also apply uh, for the, ask for the assistance of the experts on a certain matter in order to find a solution for the dispute. On the other hand, the council reconciliation committee can also ask the head of the tribes or the council of the, the communes uh, representing different parts of the society. They can also ask them to involve, to get involved in the case. The presence of women in the Reconciliation Council is also very important. Every Reconciliation Committee, had they have focus persons, it's always the same principle of the co-chairship system. They have one male, one female focus person. And this is the same principle that also apply for at every level in the in the in the region. Women's presence is also secured. Because we know that a peace cannot be achieved unless women are a part of it. Because And as we said, if a, if a matter is re related directly to women or family issues, in that case, the, in that case, the case is referred to the woman's house that they deal with these kind of cases. The disputes, the problems, the cases that are dealt by the reconciliation councils, they can be uh, family issues, social issues, trades, in different levels, in the villages, in the districts, or in the cities, or in the provinces, they are all being dealt by the Reconciliation Council and also sold. And in that case, we also have certain sanctions and punishments. And these councils, they also have capacity to to for the small for the small crimes they can also issue and decide punishment but not for the felonies that are required to be tried by the courts 
Ханси и Анжи Гуанна на реку Аликаизи, чтобы по пути ходжи вместе And even if a case is referred to a court, uh, court, in that case, the court can also ask the reconciliation committees to get involved in the case and bring the, for example, a dispute between two different families. And these reconciliation council members can also convince the elderly of those families, bring them together and make peace. So they can also find uh, facilitate a, a settlement, um, a settlement in in uh, regarding those dis disputes between different tribes or families. So, in and in different cases, when a, a case is before the court, the Reconciliation Council can also apply the court to allow them to be in, get involved and support the, their endeavors for, for peace. It has to be approved by the, uh, by the court, which are called the Court of Justice uh, of the region. Another topic, reconciliation councils are, they, they come, they are part of the society, the members are being elected, and they also have good relation, they are close relationships with the councils of the, of the regions. And as they are elected, because they are elected, they are also have right to represent the council at the uh, reconciliation council at the regional councils of general councils. They also get involved in discussions and they also write their reports regarding the, the reasons of dispute. The, and these kind of reasons or the the source of disputes can also be discussed at the level of the regional um, councils, then they can also find or recommend some, some solution. And these reports are being issued monthly and they are sent to the, uh, the council and also presented by the member representing the reconciliation committee at the level of council. So it, it, if it is the districts, they prepare their reports every month, they send it to the, the city and the city also sends it to the province and the province send it to the, uh, the canton level. And after that, the, every canton can also present his reports to the General Assembly of, uh, of the Northeastern Syria. So the, the smallest cell of this entire system is the reconciliation committees. And as we said, women houses, they also have a special uh, status within this system. The problems or disputes regarding the women are being dealt by the women's houses. It can be a domestic violence. It will be familiar problems or marriage problems and and similar problems are also dealt by, by the women's houses. It's also a civil structure. As a civil society, uh, organizations and but it also uh, as as part of the social justice system
They can also represent women at the uh, reconcil uh, reconciliation council. And it's they, they, their function is not only about getting involved in disputes or cases, but they also uh, prepare uh, reconciliation councils and the women's houses. In addition to getting involved in the cases, they also try to spread this understanding of coexistence and understanding of justice. And also women houses, they also focus in this matter, but specifically regarding the women, they also get involved with the families, with the fathers or the brothers or the husbands. And in order to find uh, solutions based on the freedom of women and also according to the legislation laws that apply in the region for the protection of women in northern eastern Syria. Therefore, women and the women's houses are always always organize themselves and there is also women's committee within the communes in every city and they are also closely related and they also have this system from the region to the cities and from the province to the country another topic the marital problems or the problems in married couples It all, it's also deal with the women's houses and it's also based on the um, approval of the men and women together. If there is a conflict or if there is violence against women, that the women houses can also or represent the woman in front of the court and if the woman doesn't want to go back to the house or to, to go back to the uh, marriage, that she is supported by the woman houses. And there are also women who are escaping the domestic violence. And they come to the women's houses and ask for help. In those cases, women houses get involved they protect the woman the woman can also stay at those at, at their facilities and they also if it is wanted by the woman they can get in touch with the family and and find a solution for those problems uh, based on the will of the woman who faced violence and as we said, they all act within the line of the freedom of women. And these women houses are also uh, supporting the other organizations working in this field, in the field of freedom of women. They can be civil society organizations or different initiatives. They are also supporting these kind of initiatives. For example, SARA is an organization specifically dealing with the domestic violence. And SARA and women's houses, they are also working together. And in the case of the domestic violence, these two organizations cooperate and they get in touch with the families. And and try to find a solution. And at the end, if the women are convinced that they help them or support them, that uh, they, can, they can go back. But in that case, the families have to promise that they will not apply any violence on that woman who suffered and asked for help. But women houses, They are at the commune level, at this province level, and also at the canton level. Uh, 
Uh, and there are also laws in the region protecting women. For example, the laws in the northern eastern Syria prohibit uh, polygamy. A man cannot marry with more women. And there are also certain laws that are protecting women and those who are violating the rights of women or using violence, they are being uh, indicted and also being punished. The violation In, in the case of uh, abuse and sexual abuse and rape, there, there are also women organizations also supporting women in order to bring the case to the court or so, uh, provide them with uh, support that they need. And there is another problem is the social, uh, the, the traditions and customs within the society which are against women. For example, some traditions require the killing a woman in certain circumstances. And the, the societies, they also, when it happens, they ask not to be punished because it's the, it's the tradition, but this is not acceptable. So anyone killing a woman on behalf in behalf of their honor or honor killings are not tolerated they are being uh, punished and and they will not get any uh, the re re reduced sentence if it is uh, with the motivation was so called protecting the honor of the man or whatsoever and our certain level, uh, on so far, we, we always had this justice system, which was a state organ. But today we are trying to bring this justice system that belongs to the, to the society. And this transition, it's not very easy. It requires more more work but court of justice system we also follow the um, the the methods that also according to the society. For example, we call them platforms. If someone committed a serious crime and it is also against a, a crime against the society, if it violates the, the moral of society, in that case, uh, if it is about this uh, society, then the platform uh, investigates the crime and the members of these platforms uh, are also people from the society. They have to be persons with with uh, with moral values and being for uh, known for being fair and these people are also influential people within the society and these people can prosecute uh, a serious uh, it's, it's, it's sorry, it's not the prosecutor, it is like a jury system. If there is a serious crime was committed, it comes to the to the to the court of justice, and in that case, every hearing is also they join and follow the every hearing and every statement, 
and eventually they they decide uh, whether that the person is guilty or not. It's also like a jury system. With, with this way that the entire society becomes part of the uh, justice system. And the problems or the, uh, the disputes also the crimes can also be seen and considered from different aspects because everyone representing the society might know different backgrounds and the certain aspects of it that might be ignored by the by the lawyers so another thing the platform system is that All the crimes and all the crimes that committed, which are also affecting the society, the, through these platforms, we can discuss about different aspects of it and kind find a way to prevent these kind of incidents or crimes. And it also Anyone member of that society should know if there's a crime committed within that society, they should know the reasons, the circumstances, and they should do something to prevent these kind of crimes taking place in future. And they take uh, necessary steps to prevent it. It will also be punished. That should also be uh, to bring justice, the feeling of justice, there are also heavy crimes or uh, heavy punishments for heavy crimes. And when the society, members of the society realize these kind of crimes taking place within the society, they will be more uh, sensible and for regarding the regarding the the proportions to prevent this kind of crimes. So these platforms, they're also supporting the justice system and they are also given the, the opportunity to get involved as representing the rest of the society, not only the victims, but the society can also be represented. Another There are, and there is also jury system, a specific jury system for the crimes, uh, for the felonies. If no one is being tried in front of the court, from six up to 12 persons, they act as jury and they decide whether this person is guilty or not guilty. So platforms are uh, representatives of the society and the juries are the ones who are deciding if the person is uh, guilty or not guilty. And that's how the justice system organizes itself and we Court of Justice there with this system, we have two instances. One of them is the, uh, the first instance is the courts, the, the first instance courts, and the second instance is the um, appeal, Court of Appeals. This is- um, may, may I intervene just for a quick moment? Uh, uh, I uh, um, I'm just giving you a notice that okay. you have 10 minutes left in your speak. Okay. <laughs> okay. No problem. We also have a specific Council of Justice for Women. 
which is also a part of the general justice system. And this court, it is also, it is specifically dealing with the crimes against women. It can be about violence, domestic violence or uh, discrimination against women or different problems that women face in their everyday life. It can be injustice, it can be disadvantages whatsoever. So these cases are also being dealt by the Council of Justice for Women. It is also And it, uh, the, the members of those councils are also women. And the final goal is that we all these decisions are made according to the principles of this moral and political society. And it also aims at bringing a change in the relationship between different genders, men and women and also bringing the justice, the feeling of justice for women. Council of Justice for Women is composed of the members of the women houses, from the female members of the reconciliation committees. Uh, they come together and they compose the um, Council of Justice for Women. Every every sort of violence against women and all the traditions or which are against women, misogynist traditions are all being dealt within the uh, this council of women for uh, for for justice and women's council for justice also work in order to change the mentality of women which creates significant problems for women it's also uh, compromises the different traditions and customs and it's trying to bring the voice of women regarding these topics and it also has an influence on the piece of on the legislation that the uh, uh, made by the councils and they and protecting the interest of a woman that's in general or this is the general structure of the justice system the consolation councils and court of justice and the woman uh, system with the woman they have also have their parallel system but all these systems or these uh, structures they are cooperating together and at the end, every region, they are autonomous. Jezair, Membech, Shrapka, resort. these are all the autonomous regions. And every region, they have their autonomous administrations. And they all have their legislative body, executive body, and the justice bodies. But there is also a coordination among all these autonomous regions at the level of north and eastern Syria, then, then they have this council of justice uh, of entire north and eastern Syria. It's a council, it's a it's there the it's it's more like doing like policy making is their task and they are issuing guidelines and there is and there is we also have a special course against terror or terror crimes it's called the courts for the protection of the of the society these terror courts Uh, it tries only those Syrian citizens or the people from Syria who are involved in terror activities. However, not the foreign foreign citizens. But we know that um, 
uh, ISIS committed crimes against humanity, they committed genocide, they committed crimes, war crimes, but the foreign members of ISIS cannot be tried in, 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 in Syria. There are like thousands of ISIS fighters uh, coming from 60 different countries. These ISIS members are being kept uh, in prisons, but um, the ad autonomous administration of Northern Eastern Syria uh, called the international community to support them for an international criminal court, but these calls have been remain, uh, they, they didn't get any answers. So they are trying to start their uh, trials soon. And the, the people of this region, they sacrificed a lot. They paid really high prices to protect the region, to, to fight against the ISIS, to defeat the ISIS. And now, and now they are being abandoned. They are being left without support because the fight against ISIS was not only for, for us or for Syria. It was a fight that we carried out on behalf of the humanity. And the fight against ISIS is still going on. And the trial of these foreign members of ISIS should be considered as part of this cooperation uh, in the fight against terror. And maybe you have might have heard recently the autonomous administration announced that they want to they will start with the trials of those uh, foreign members of ISIS. And as a result, because they cannot postpone them, postpone these trials anymore, and but they will use the local uh, laws, anti-terror laws in the in the trials of those foreign ISIS members. And another problem is that there will be there will be more problems regarding the punishment or serving the punishment they are given uh, as a result of those trials and it will be all according to the local standards. It, it cannot be the international standards. It will be, and the decision that are given by these courts will not be recognized in the international uh, arena because these are the courts of uh, not courts uh, under a recognized state. And I'm sure in future we will face more uh, problems in future and we will discuss them uh, in, in future, but it's important to try these people and bring them to justice because the people of this region, they suffered a lot and they are also asking for justice for their lost. And uh, in these trials, the victims uh, they will also be a part of these, these trials and they are asking for justice. And it is important for the people of Kobani, Raqqa, Deir Azori, who suffered a lot under ISIS rule and suffered these unspeakable crimes. Now they are asking for justice in order to, 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 to feel lighter, uh, to feel lighter uh, and to make their pain a little bit lighter. And as, as we said, but all these trials, because due to lack of international support, will be carried out according to local standards. And there are also many female fighters of ISIS because there are thousands of male fighters and there are also thousands of women and children their family members are also kept in the camp and some of those women are also radicalized and they committed crimes. And we see that the, the rest of those women are also have these radical 
thoughts because they have been brainwashed and radicalized by the ISIS, even if they didn't involve in uh, fighting, they have these radical feelings and they're raising their children with this ideology. And we see that in the camps where the women are being kept, the ISIS ideology is reviving itself and keeping itself alive among those um, inhabitants of those, those uh, camps. So it is a pressing issue to try these foreign members of ISIS and bring them to justice. And therefore, the autonomous administration uh, needs international support in these trials. Uh, I hope I didn't speak too long, and this is the general uh, description that I would like to share with you. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you so much, uh, Ainur. That was uh, fascinating. Um, uh, an uh, incredible story, um, uh, an amazing experiment in social uh, justice, uh, according to these uh, principles of uh, uh, morality and democratic uh, governance that you described at the beginning of your talk. Uh, I was particularly struck uh, in this last portion where you're describing the difficulties uh, in bringing um, uh, international uh, terrorists to justice in Northeast Syria. Um, former uh, members of ISIS and their families and uh, the inevitable difficulties are going to arise uh, if and when these people are brought to court uh, and uh, convicted. And then what happens in the course after given that there is no international recognition of uh, uh, Northeast Syria as a, um, as a formal uh, uh, justice system uh, internationally. So this is an incredibly powerful and complicated uh, question. Um, so I have a couple of questions and I would like to return to at the end of our dialogue, but I would like now to invite our good friend who has been waiting patiently uh, 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 to uh, respond to the um, to the comments made by Anur. So, Father, would you please uh, take the mic? Okay, fine, good. <laughs> cool. One thing I begin with a lot of appreciation for this initiative, for this experiment, and for whatever they have been achieving is unique. And I have been promoting something similar, and I used to call it neighborocracy, a, a bottom of governance more or less along the same lines. And whenever I speak about that, I want to convince them that this is possible. So I need to give them some success stories. And wherever I talk, I quote now the Rojava experience. Earlier, of course, I was quoting Kudumbashri experience of Kerala. Uh, it was a very convincing experience with regard to certain aspects because they have nearly 300,000 uh, neighborhood groups federated up to three levels. But even that was already amazing, convincing people I get awestruck that such a lot of groups could be organized. And when we tell people that the neighborhood should be organized as small sized inclusive forums, and they say, how to organize such a lot of forums? Then I tell them, see in Kerala, they are organized 300,000 forums and there are countries. For example, I, when I went to Chile and Peru, I used to tell them 
you see, if they could a state could organize that, you are a country. And they have 35 million people, and you have only half the population. If you do something, it becomes a country-wide model success story, inspiring many like that. So for me, it has been a big uh, support, this Kudumbasri experience, but it was falling short in certain respects because it was more a kind of, uh, not exactly a fully governance participation approach. And then it went only up to one or two levels not up to all the levels of governance dis related decision making. So then I was looking for something better. Then all of a sudden, one of my friends introduced me to Java. Ever since wherever I go, I am speaking about it. And uh, so my congratulations. And uh, you are showing a way to the world. That way you are making a big contribution we are very grateful. I wish you all well. The whole world should support this. And today, as we are sharing about the justice systems, I think the whole world must come to learn from you, the judicial systems and the legal systems on how to make justice a kind of a wholesome, healthy approach, integral approach. And you are covering all the aspects. I mean, uh, uh, bringing a reconciliation, then the other aspects all put together, involved me, women, involved in the community, cultural traditions, everything. It's a big process. It is really a struggle, I know, because there are various nuances and various cultures are working together and you are steering through it very beautifully, and we wish you all success. In Kerala now, in the Kerala state in, uh, in India, there are centers, training centers to train people from other countries. They come to learn the process. I wish you all start similar training programs. And then uh, I am very grateful that this global university movement that's now we are participating is taking this message across the whole world, making them discuss and dialogue about it. And I'm deeply grateful to that too. Now, along the process, and I just thought, instead of saying more on the nuances, I would share also on a related uh, process that I have been trying to promote. Not that there is much, this Rojava people could learn much from, because I have really a lot to learn from them. Uh, I am learning a lot from them, and I have a lot to, more to learn from them. And but still sharing a kind of com a notes for us to compare, uh, compare notes like that to see wherever we can support and enrich. And as I have been listening to this, uh, uh, this, I mean, uh, this I mean, explanation on the justice system, I thought I have also more material to add, uh, more chapters to add from this experience in our neighbor aggressive book also. Well, I will share whatever we have, because something similar, maybe it is interesting for you and maybe interesting for those who are not heard about it. We are in dialogue with this Rajava group, our neighborhood group and the Rajava group, we are in dialogue and we are happy about it. And then I am just sharing the way we are going through something similar. Maybe it will corroborate. Okay. Now we have what we call neighborhood and we call it a kind of governance from below. And then we still know, why do you want a kind of a neighborhood, a neocracy? Then we say democracy is good in principle as ruled by people for the people of the people, etc. But the way it is practiced leaves a lot to be desired and it frustrates. Why? There are two or three aspects. 
I cost, uh, quote only two or three aspects. One thing is it uh, creates divisions. That means every time a decision is made, it's not the type of a reconciliatory approach the Rajava is for, uh, following, but it's a kind of win and lose approach. One group wins, the other group loses. And then it, every time a decision is made, a division is made. Every time an election is made, a division is made. Uh, then it is a question of a number game, majority, minority. So it's a kind of majority and minority and number game. So what happens eventually to get more members, so be on the winning position to resort to all kinds of dirty tactics. And that's happening. Every time there is an election, you can almost always predict that there will be some kind of this you know, communally divisive event taking place. Earlier it happened for us in one state. Now it is happening in another state in India. So this kind of tactics go on, unhealthy tactics, and they continue, and they should not be allowed. Then another thing we said, though it is ruled by people, people are not really ruling. I asked, today also I had a training program. I asked them, are you really ruling? They said, okay, we have election. Then I asked them, do you really have a say when election takes place? It is your voice that is represented. As you are presented two candidates from two money, uh, money power centers, and they present two candidates. You have to choose between the devil and the deep sea. Do you have much content in your choice? No. So that means you are not ruling. You have no voice. When you have no voice, you are not exactly ruling. So you are taken for a ride. Can there be a governance system where everybody really rules, not merely the moneyed people, influential people, the powerful people, but everybody on the last man? And for that, we said we need systems. Then we said, no, for this, we proposed a system. And the system is um, multi tier federation of. Uh, Parliament, neighborhood parliaments of about 30 families each, but at various levels. And we say they should follow certain principles. I, the principles number one, we say smallification. That means make things small. Uh, we say the biggest problem why people are not able to participate is that forums are too big. We just give the principle, the bigger a forum becomes, the more it becomes the game of the powerful big voices, big not normally in terms of money, and the small voices go unheard. They become voiceless. And here, what we find in practice, the, but the constituency, electing constituencies are so big that you cannot meet one another, you cannot know one another. You are only a number lost. That means, you know, we give an example today. In my parliamentary constituency where I come from, it's nearly 200, 20, 100,000 people. And in such a big forum, who alone can talk? Only people who have enough money power to give enough publicity, mobilization, rallies, and everything like that. Only they get elected. At the end, it becomes a rule by the rich, of the rich, and for the rich. So how to, I mean, uh, uh, confront the situation, what to do about it? We said, make the forum small. How small? We said, you should be small enough that everybody can talk, participate, everybody can have a name, face, and uh, get attention, and then you know feel that they are actually contributing. For this, okay, big, uh, small enough. Then we say it should also be big enough. 
that it sustains itself. Then we said if it is just 10 members or so, two people may have some guests, two people may have some uh, gone to some other village, and two people may have, may have gone to the doctor for sickness, and the meeting doesn't take place. If the meeting doesn't take place, and the meetings of the life that of any organization, it doesn't they die out. So to sustain that, we said it could be 30 families forums. Even if 20 families don't come, still the 10 families will hold the fort and continue the process. So could we said, why not 30 family forums? We call these forums neighborhood parliaments. And these parliaments take charge of their neighborhood. They become the government for the neighborhood. They have their own ministers. Almost everybody becomes a minister to attend to the various needs of the community and to the needs of the wider world to which this community will like to make a response. So then that becomes a kind of a participatory governance system at the base, and they get federated to elect one level elects representative to the next level. So neighborhood elects next percent is second level parliament. Second level parliament elects represent third level. Like this one level election, the next level, rather than straight from the base to the top national parliament. So this way, at every level, people sit together. We say smallification means not only at the base, at every level, it should be small. Face-to-face -face community, where everybody can sit around in one circle, nobody behind anybody else, and everybody talk without a microphone. That's the viable size. So both at the base and at every level above, be it at the state level, national level, international level, global level, it should be a small forum. That at every level, everybody is somebody, everybody is heard, everybody can participate. So we call that principle smallness. The second principle follows from this recall. If it is now in the present day system, you have no scope to recall because such a costly affair because big constituency and big expenses like that. You cannot have elections every day, naturally. But we say here it is small at every level, small sized forum. If it is small sized forum at every level, any day you can call your forum and make decision to call back an elected, that express, call back an ele a representative elected from your, le your level to the level immediately above. So if I, at every level, you can call back an elected representative any day, the whole time on a day-to-day -day basis, not only once in five years on a token basis, whole time on a full basis, the base, the base, the neighborhood people are controlling the entire system. People at the base are controlling the entire system. If they have power that way to control, then their needs will be addressed, their problems will be solved. So it be, the whole system becomes accountable. Then we bring the principle of subsidiarity. Subsidiarity means you know, action and decisions at the lowest level possible. So whatever can be done at the, any low level or any um, decentralized level, don't take it to any higher level. The higher level deal with only those matters that no lower level can handle. Then we ask them what would be the advantage. In the discussion, we ask. This is most of the decisions, where will it be taken at the base? At the base, who are all the people? Uh, people, the common people, ordinary people, the poor people, the affected people, everybody is there. And if they are becoming part of all the, most of the decisions, and they are consulted for most of these decisions. How would they feel? They said they will feel valued and they will feel important. They will feel recognized. I said, that's important. The recognition is a core problem. Everybody wants to be recognized. And here, everybody in this process gets automatically recognized. That means much of the psychological tensions and problems get over. And so that's the principle of VCF subsidiarity. 
and then the fourth principle we say follows on the first principle. That means we call principle numerical uniformity, number wise uniformity. It is like this in the first level, neighborhood can contain only 30 families, it has to be small. Second level, if it has to be small, it can contain representatives from really so many uh, first level parliaments. <laughs> and third level, if it has to be small, it can contain represent only second level. Only so many second level parliaments could be represented. It means at every level, uh, only so much segment of population could be involved. That means no neighborhood uh, parliament will be bigger than any other neighborhood parliament. No second level parliament will be bigger than any other second level parliament. When you go on this way, no state will be bigger than any other state and no nation will be bigger than any other nation. This we call numerical uniformity. We say that means if every nation has more or less same amount of population, uh, if that is the principle guiding, there will not be border wars. If no border wars, no war at all. And if no war at all, no defense expenses, and all the money those both for killing purposes, all nuclear arm expenses and everything could go for constructive purposes. Then we bring also a kind of a fifth principle. We call it convergence. Uh, that's very easy to explain. We say it's not very difficult to organize the entire world as neighborhood parliaments because you don't need to take a bus to organize your neighborhood and to tell the whole world, okay, this is something we want to do that will be good for advantages in so many respects. So all you do is to come together in your neighborhood and choose one convener to begin with. And that will not take much time. Then we say, but it's difficult to sustain it. To sustain means people should keep warning it, have allegiance to it, have commitment to it, be ready to work for it. All this is a big process. And how would you ensure a sustained involvement? And this we found from experience. Uh, and the communities come together when they have something to do. When they have, they have something to do in common, they want to know who are all this we and who are all outside? Uh, who, all, who all can contribute what? And how we can manage to get them around? All this means interactions. And when they interact more and more, they become more and more cohesive, glued together, and they will be like a collective identity, a collective ego. When any group's collective ego is adequately reinforced, they won't allow anybody to bypass them. So this way we strengthen the base. When the base is strengthened, the rest follows. Then we circulate initially these five principles. Uh, when we circulated, some two people wrote and asked, have we heard about sociocracy? Till then we did not hear about it. Then we hunted for it. Then what we found, more or less same approaches, but something in a way much little more defined and focused than ours. One thing was consent-based decision-making, not majority-based. They said not even consensus-based, not unanimity-based, because people will have uh, different uh, preferential options based on their psychology and other needs and so on. So very difficult, very, uh, practically a little difficult to come to that consensus decision every time. So what they said came to another one, consent based. I may not be in full agreement, but still I know that at this stage, if everybody is to give a consent, only this is the highest possible. So I say, Though I am not it fully for it, I give my go ahead, go ahead. I will be also cooperating with you. But I still keep right to reserve my opinions and I may still keep convincing you tomorrow it may be all right. So in sociocracy, they make the decisions best for now and safe enough to try. And at the end of every decision, they had a review date. So we will review this decision that day to see if it is still relevant. Okay, that's the concern based decision making. Another thing is socio-critic elections. Today also I conduct a demonstration section in a training program. See, people need not divide themselves <laughs> every time they make a decision. 
and in addition they can get even more united by taking a decision together and for this sociocratic decision elections help us uh, it's a very interesting process uh, i normally give it a demonstration but to explain it a little bit they ask okay what's the role so they have a role role clarification of everybody they go about us uh i very one at one point at a time and all the points are over how do you understand this rule what are the challenges what are the i mean things expected what are the challenges to be faced so all these things come are were clear and there's no role clarification goes on and on until all the points are over and then they ask okay we have now the some clarity regarding the role now to shoulder this role what type of a person would you need and then it goes on like this that this competence this background this skill this skill this orientation this type of attitudes and like that goes on and then they say okay you take a slip of paper write your own name on the top so everybody writes one own name and then the facilitator takes some time silently think seriously who would be the person who would be best able to fit in this role so after some silence everybody is asked write the name of the person whom they propose under one own name so all the slips are collected facilitate us you so and so propose what are your reasons so everybody has to propose i mean explain the reasons in public and after everybody has explained the facilitator says okay initially you were you propose somebody and you had your own reasons individually thinking you found so and so was the best but now you are listen to various other arguments maybe you find somebody else arguments more relevant than yours then okay take your pay slip and put it for somebody else and before you put it for somebody else you explain to the group what now makes you change and the others may be guided also according so once after this giving chance for changing their proposals even then they don't go by the number of ballots number of proposals but rather they take the arguments together and interact with them reason out with them and eventually lead them to a kind of consensus and propose a person and then they ask because of this and this and these reasons it's all done you know i mean uh, openly with everybody not nothing secret because of these and these reasons i propose so and so so then as any objection any objection any objection every objection is invited rather than tolerated in social press because that strengthens in to insulate the uh, uh, i mean decisions better so then if if so anybody has objection there what's the reason objection should be argued and serious enough to call for a revival if the objection is valid they say okay that's a good i uh, mean valid objection you have to take it seriously then why not you look for somebody then why not for this and this and this reason this person any objection in it no objection okay then election and at the end everybody is happy everybody has a win win situation so like that also they have their decision making patterns so we integrate all these things and we propose this and then we start everywhere this can i mean can i ask you to, hello Father, can, I ask, can i ask you to conclude in about 2 minutes sure sure yeah okay and then uh, we start this you know experiments in various places uh we have various groups working under various names and they all try to promote this and we go also as a support to measure we go with inclusive neighborhood children's parliaments and that is our glamorous program like that means you know, whatever we want to do for the grown ups we the same pattern we follow inclusive neighborhood parliaments children inclusive ward parliaments of children like this goes on national parliament in a global parliament like that so we have our global provisional children's parliaments 
uh, we call it uh, provisional because the real parliament comes from when everybody is organized from below. This is starting point, provisional. And our children, the last two, two, five or six months, two of our children in the provisional world address UN meetings at two occasions. So like this, we have various language and we try to share the concept. And in all this, our biggest encouragement and biggest convincing argument is the success story of Rajawa. And for that, I thank them very much. I finished concourse. Thank you. Thank you so much, my friend. Uh, fascinating work, uh, incredibly uh, ambitious and uh, best of luck to you. Uh, I am um, always uh, inspired by these uh, experimentations in uh, local autonomy and democratic practice at all of these levels. Two fascinating examples. One with the social justice system that was just outlined to us um, by our colleague uh, in Rojava, and now the um, the experiment in neighborhood councils that you just outlined for us. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I have uh, uh, two questions I would like to uh, pose uh, to our our main speaker uh, about uh, the uh, the justice system in Rojava. One question is. Uh, is there a formal criminal code? Has there been an established criminal code uh, either taken from other jurisdictions or from uh, the previous administrations in Syria, or has there been uh, an informal or new criminal code that is being applied uh, by uh, the Kurdish people and the other groups in Northeast Syria? So that's my first question. Is there a criminal code, either formal or informal, and how was it uh, developed? And the second question is, for the most severe crimes uh, against society, for example, or for ter terrorists, uh, is there a provision for the death penalty, or is the death penalty not allowed in Rojava? Those are my questions. I suppose the speaker, I suppose we are, I suppose we are father, uh, father to come. Uh, I also would like to thank to uh, Father Edwin. It was really interesting. And then the way that you explained the system in the Rojava and the councils that you explained, they look very similar. And the main principle is that from bottom to up, so it's always about being local and giving voice to the locals. And the secondly, the current system in Rojava Northeastern the reconciliation councils in, in, in Rojava, they are dealing with like around 80% of the problems and of the society. And the women's houses, they built since 2018 to 2023, they dealt with 7,750 cases related to the women. So, among them, around 28,000 problems were dealt with the women's houses itself and the rest were referred to the different reconciliation committees and then after after that it was referred to the uh, house um, court of justice and about these women houses like last year there were only six like six women researchers they came from different places from world they came from the usa european countries they accompanied us in our everyday work and they in order to learn the system and when we come to the, the 
panel courts about in Syria, uh, in, in northern eastern Syria, some of them are taken from the previous administration and some of them are new written written and modi cod modif modificates modif modif modificated according to our principles and ideology for example death penalty we don't have it in syria even for the terror crimes uh, we don't have capital punishment which used to exist in the in the at the time of the syrian regime and the rest and according to the maybe syrian penal courts some even small crimes were severely punished and they given very long year of uh, imprisonment now we modif we changed uh, amended all those punishments and we don't consider it as punishments but also a reform of persons so instead of long year of imprisonment we give a different uh, way of uh, did are given shorter shorter imprisonment punishment so in general we can say some of them are were inherited from the former uh, system some some laws were taken from the other countries and some of them were written according to the uh, our ideology and the punishments were also changed according to the inner um proportionality between the crime and and the punishment and the equality and the equality between women and men are also uh, ensured in, in 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 our laws for example in the syrian law if a man kills a woman or in order to protect his honor he wouldn't be punished but today if you kill a man or if you kill a woman the punishment are the same and as i said in the syrian penal court there are death penalty which we don't practice in northern eastern syria okay thank you so much thank you um, so we still have some time left uh, until uh, the end of our session. We have about uh, 20 minutes. Um, so uh, the floor is open for other uh, questions or comments from our participants. Please do uh, pose your question in the chat uh, or uh, raise your hand and we'll see if we can uh, get them uh, up for discussion. Sarah? Um, I have a question here uh, from Ian Campbell, who says, uh, Father Edwin, can you describe how in the first parish where you started to organize neighborhood parliaments, uh, how you came together to stop the violence and crime that was there? I have heard you tell the story of starting local justice committees or something like that. Towards yeah. the end of 1970s, I was sent to a, a violent coastal parish in, uh, in the southernmost district of India. And so I saw much factional fights, and nearly 300 of them were involved in various criminal cases. Like, then I said, Why is this problem taking place? Because people are not organized to talk among themselves, discuss together, decide together. So they become victims of the gang leaders. Like, So I, then I started gradually organizing, taking inspiration from Latin America, basic communities of about 30, 30 families, neighborhood communities. And then uh, we made them come together quite frequently to discuss about various issues. And then we started a system where then we got some five people from each neighborhood of 30 families to form the representative general body of the village. 
And then in addition to this, we also had a kind of, for everything we get representatives from the neighborhood communities. We said we should have one more to, we called it peace committee, like the name was peace committee, like a reconciliation committee here. And this role was to listen to the grievance of people, bring peace, and more or less like a court it was. So we said, elect one person from each neighborhood of 30 families, uh, and that for this court, that means, you know, they have to be judges. They have to treat you with fairness. So choose properly, like. So they sent representatives Some 17 such neighborhoods were there. They would all of them sit and then, uh, and they had enough experience of the courts and so on because they were involved in various criminal cases and so on. And these people would sit together and then receive an agreements petitions and people have to pay us a kind of court fee like, and they will sit together. And then gradually they sorted things out. Uh, for each, they, with consulting everybody, they tried to bring some acceptable solutions to problems. And by the time I returned from the turn, uh, came back from the parish after five and a half years, most of these criminal cases, uh, they were brought to nearly zero, like only two or three cases were still remaining, but that was related to certain problem. I said that, that the village now handled it. So that, and it worked so well that even police station, if somebody goes there, they say, you have a court in your village, you know, go there. Like, so people are able to decide together. And when they decide together, no, they know the realities of the village. They take everything into account and then give proper, relevant, situationally appropriate conclusions. And it worked very well. So that was my experience. Amazing, amazing. Um, I also have uh, uh, another question. This is directed to uh, Ainur um, from Sarah. Um, Sarah is asking, uh, I am wondering how the Rojava system works in regions that are less exposed to Oshalan's liberation ideas and where widely agreed morality may be quite conservative, especially with respect to women, but also with not keeping to religious norms. ها يعني اوكان فيجن فكر فلسفة وجلان وجلان's idea and Erdogan lived in Syria almost for 20 years so he had good relationships with not only to the Kurds but also with the other different ethnicities and religious groups even Arabs Armenians and Assyrians but in terms of the um, tribal system, it's very strong in Syria. And uh, we also have special approach to the tribes in order to integrate and bring them into system. It was before the, uh, it was Before ISIS, there was this Jepetul Nusra, so a kind of uh, an organization related to Al Qaeda. So before these regions were liberated by the by the Syrian Democratic Forces, they suffered a lot under Jepetul Nusra and ISIS rules. So once we liberated these regions, those girls who were forced to wear headscarves, who were deprived of right to education and who couldn't go to school, they had a very real sympathy to Erdogan's ideas and this liberation of the liberty of women, freedom of women, they were really welcoming. And it also uh, enabled the, the influence from the, um, from the Kurdish regions where we had already established our system. So we can say today, Arab women are now members of the YPG, Women's Army. 
those women who couldn't leave the house at the time of the traditional lifestyle and because of the Islamic organizations, now they are fighting at the front. So uh, Arab women are also doing the same. They are, in, they are getting involved in politics. They are in, at the administration. And we have specific women organizations just for Arab women in Arab uh, speaking regions based on the freedom of women. So because of the, because they had suffered a lot for, from this extremist Islamist, they welcomed this ideology of Erjalan. And, and also our women's movement is also very active in those regions. We have uh, also women's Council, it's composed of not only of Kurdish women, but also Arab women and Assyrian and other ethnicities and religious. And the same, the General Assembly of Northern Eastern Syria uh, has representatives, members from every different ethnicity and religious group. So it also played a, a role and it also very uh, positively influenced the population living in those regions. Thank you. Um, here's another question from Ian Campbell uh, for, for you, uh, Ainur. Um, what is the prison population in North and East Syria when you don't include the ISIS fighters or other ISIS-related individuals and families? I don't have the exact and um, statistics because there are always new people who are arrested and are uh, released. And from time to time, we also have amnesties. Even those people who didn't serve the entire punishment, they might be uh, released. And it's not a central. Uh, it's a, not a central system. I don't. I cannot give you statistics uh, about regarding the persons. It's changing every day. Right. Okay. Um, I, uh, I will put one final question and because um, I don't see any others at the moment, uh, and then we will conclude. Um, a big, big problem, a big issue, of course, is the, uh, the camps and the incarceration of the ISIS prisoners uh, and how they're going to be dealt with. Um, is there any um, uh, possible solution or prospect for some collaboration with other nations, with the United States uh, or other potential allies as to how to deal with this very large uh, camp population uh, that is keeping uh, um, former ISIS fighters and their families um, uh, in these camps. How do you see that that could be resolved? And is it possible that it's going to be resolved soon? Indeed, there are some countries, they are accepting the females and children their own citizens, but the men and the fighters, they, they don't want to take them. We have women from Tunisia, Algeria, or Saudi Arabia, but the Arab countries, they are not taking any citizens back, but the European countries or the other countries, they are only accepting women and children. But and the, the trial of the ISIS members, it's beyond our capabilities in terms of legislation, in terms of the physical possibilities. 
um, it's not only about the legislation. Of course, we have a legislation for terror-related uh, crimes, but terror, it's not only terror that ISIS did, it's beyond terror, the crimes against humanity, crimes, war crimes. Therefore, we need support from the countries, especially the ones who are the members of the International Coalition Against ISIS. In, it can be a, a joint court, international court for ISIS, or it can be a hybrid, uh, like an international tribunal. We were at the beginning, they were kind of talking about the, an international tribunal, but nobody wanted to support us or they wanted to establish a special court an ad hoc court for isis but for that you need a decision from the uh, security council of the united nations which seems difficult to have an ad hoc court for isis and as i said autonomous administration wanted to establish a local court because there was no support from the international community but yet we are still uh, in need of international support even the tribunal will be a local one but if there is any support will come uh, that might come from abroad from different countries the uh, autonomous administration will welcome them it can be financial support, it can be security, it can be any any support will be welcome. Okay. As lawyers, we, we, we would like to actually have a process, a, a mutual one, both with the participation of the uh, autonomous administration and either international courts or other countries and also the victims and the families of victim can be present and represented. Okay, okay, very difficult, very complex situation. Thank you, Einar. Um, uh, there was one last uh, question from uh, Sarah and she's asking, uh, what can we read about the experiments in grassroots democracy in India? So what I would like to ask is uh, perhaps in the chat, uh, Father, you can uh, suggest a couple of uh, books on uh, experiments in grassroots uh, democracy in India, certainly um, uh, uh, writings on Kerala and the story of Kerala's uh, um, uh, experimentation. In, uh, uh, in like localized democracy is a very good to place to start. Uh, myself, yeah, uh, I myself have written on on Kerala um, in uh, my current book, Civilizing the State, Reclaiming Politics for the Common Good. So you can certainly refer to that uh, for some uh, interesting background on the application of uh, local democratic principles in Kerala. Uh, and uh, and then we can share maybe uh, uh, along with the description of the video uh, some additional readings that you can suggest, Father. So uh, we are exactly at the end of our two-hour session. Uh, a most fascinating uh, discussion and presentation from both our speakers. So uh, I would like on behalf of everybody uh, and the co-sponsors of this lecture to thank you uh, Ainur and yourself, Father, uh, for taking part. Uh, it's a privilege to be uh, working with you on the presentation of the Rojava experience through these uh, webinars and this lecture series. The next lecture will be exactly in two weeks' time. Uh, 